Hey guys, thanks for joining me for another episode of Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today we're going to take a look at Secrets of the Lost Tomb. This is a game that was put out by Everything Epic. It is a one to six player game, and it takes roughly an hour and a half to two hours to play, depending upon the scenario you choose. In the box, there are seven different scenarios to choose from. And uh, in the game, each player is going to take control of an adventurer or adventurers, depending upon the number of players you're playing. And they are going to go into a tomb that they will explore different tiles, and each tile will, will have different effects, different uh, cards will come up, and the players will have to roll dice to complete different checks based on the stats that they have. As they complete different objectives and uh, do different things, uh, the game will wind down and uh, the final boss will be summoned at some point. If the players are able to defeat him or meet whatever certain objectives are for that scenario that they're playing, then they will win. If not, then they will lose the game. So my impressions of this game so far, I've enjoyed it. Um, it has been a lot of fun. I've played a couple of games with my friends so far. We've had a good time. I do enjoy the dice chucking elements and there is enough strategy in it to keep me interested. It does have a lot of the dungeon uh, delving elements that I do enjoy about some of these games. Um, so I definitely would give it a thumbs up and uh, definitely would recommend checking it out uh, if it's a game that you're interested in. Uh, there's a lot of uh, pulp references to some of the popular movies. Uh, as you look through some of the cards, the item cards, the artifact cards, um, just uh, all kinds of different things that you'll come up, some of the rooms you'll explore, you'll be like, ah, I think that was from that movie. Um, so that was fun uh, and enjoyable. The only downside that I saw to this game is that it does seem like you have to reference the rulebook a fair number of times for the different things, uh, but they do provide quick reference charts for you that help with some of those things as well. And some of it, I think, is just learning curve. So as you play the game uh, more and more, uh, you won't have to do that as much. So overall, very, very small. It, uh, it really wasn't that big of a deal. And like I said, it, you know, it, once you, you play it a couple times, I think some of that will go away. So um, other than that, I definitely would recommend checking out the game. Um, there's tons of expansions out for it. And if you're a miniatures guy like me, they do provide upgrade packs that will upgrade your uh, heroes and uh, monsters to actual miniatures as well. Um, I will be covering one of the expansions in the future, so uh, you guys will get to take a look at some of that too to see what uh, comes in an expansion box and that. And uh, so let's head to the table and I'll teach you how to play. One of the core features of Secrets of the Lost Tomb is rolling dice and doing dice checks. So in Secrets of the Lost Tomb, we're going to be using 12 sided dice and each dice will have two sides of the same number. So there will be two ones, which are critical fails, twos, threes, fours, fives, which are successes, and sixes, which are critical successes. And like I said, there will be two of each of those numbers on each dice. There are three different types of creatures you're going to fight in the game. You have base creatures, elite creatures, and bosses. And you can tell each type of creature by the symbol that's in the top of the card, as well as the background of the card. So your base creatures will have that symbol, and will have the gold background. The elites will have that symbol, and the red background. And then finally the bosses will have the boss symbol, and they will have the larger cards. Now the one other type of creature you will run into are the swarms and they'll list swarm, and that will apply for the base creatures and the elite creatures will have potentially have swarms in them. Now from there then each card is going to have the creature's name on the top, and then underneath that will be any special abilities that creature has, and then going down the side of the card are the stats of that creature. So we have the creature's movement, courage attack, combat rating, armor, health, evasion rating, and finally, soul shards that that creature will drop when it's killed. And we're going to take a look at all these creatures in more depth during combat so you can see how these different abilities and that work. Here we have the three different decks that are included in, in the game that you can get abilities and equipment from. So the first one is a Soulmonger deck. When a, pl a player enters a Soulmonger space, they can visit the shop and use their soul shards to purchase specific cards that they choose. So the top of each one of these cards will be the name, 
the cost in soul shards that that card is, and in any special abilities that that card has. From there, then we have the item deck, which has a ton of different items ranging from health to different types of armor and weapons. For weapons and other items that players can use, it'll list the ability of that weapon. So this one uses dexterity, the name of the weapon, as well as how many hands it takes to use it, and then the abilities of that weapon that they have. The last deck that we have is the artifact deck, which is kind of like the rare items deck. These items can be very powerful, and as usual, they will have their name at the top, a picture of the artifact, and then any special abilities that that artifact will grant that player. Here are some examples of companion cards that you will run into throughout the game. So the top of each card will be the name of that companion, and then its artwork, followed by any special rules that that companion has or grants to the hero that has them, and the number of hit points that that companion has, which any time a hero is required to take damage, they can pass that damage along to any companions that they have. When that, that companion has enough damage to equal its result, then it will be simply discarded. With the Tomb Deck, you're going to customize this deck at the beginning of the game, based on the difficulty that you want the game to be. If you want a normal game, only include the cards with the green border. If you want an intermediate game, include both the green and the red bordered cards. And if you want a hard game, then include the red bordered cards only. Other than that, during the tomb phase, you will draw one of these tomb cards and resolve it starting at step one and working your way down through each step in a row. And we will cover this more during the tomb phase itself. Here we have four examples of the different tiles you guys are going to see during your adventures. So the first tile here we have, it has a red border around it. So with that, that means that that tile is one of the tiles that monsters can spawn in when you're required to spawn monsters during the tomb phase, which we'll take a closer look at at that point. Each of these tiles will also have these little comet symbols, which will mark the doorways where heroes can explore through and move through. So this particular tile is a dark trap tile. So at the top corner here, it's going to list that it's a trap and the number of trap tokens that you will place on that tile when it's explored the first time. After that, each time a hero moves in that tile, they will remove one of those trap tokens and resolve the effects at the bottom here. So with this one, we would take a dexterity test. If we fail the test, then we're gonna take two damage and we'll receive the poisoned effect. The next tile here is the Arc Portal. When you enter this one for the first time, you would draw an adventure card and resolve the adventure based on the symbol up here. So this one is an adventure, not a misadventure. And then after that, then the, the tile itself has an ability that you can use as an action. So this one lets you move your character to any explored room in the tomb if you spend an action in that tile. The next one here is the Chamber of Ages. With this one, it ha uh, has a objective in it, so when you find this, you'll go ahead and look in the scenario book and read what the effects of that are. Other than that, when the first time you explore this, this tile, you would receive plus one to any attribute of your choice. The last tile we're going to look at is an artifact tile. So with that, anytime you are on an artifact tile, you can spend one of your actions to attempt to search for the artifact that is listed there. You can do this only one time per game, per adventurer. And to do that, then you would roll the number of dice based on the audacity that you have. If you successfully roll what you need, then you have found that artifact and will pull it out of the artifact deck and only spend one audacity to do so. If you fail, then you would spend two audacity and you will not receive that artifact and you cannot search again or and you cannot use Audacity to reroll those results. On top of that, this one also has another objective. So again, you would refer to the scenario book that you're playing and resolve that objective as well. Here we have the Adventure Misadventure deck, and you will be instructed to draw these cards when you explore tiles that have their symbols in the top corner. So for Adventure cards, it will be the Compass, and for Misadventure cards, it will be the Skull and Crossbones. When you draw a card, you will draw the top card from underneath this sleeve, which is double-sided, and flip the card based on the side that you need. 
from there, then you would read the top instructions, which is usually some sort of a test. If you pass the test, then you will read the, the past results. And if you fail the test, then you will read the, or you will read the failed result. For player setup, each player will go through the hero deck and choose a hero or heroes that he would like to play in this adventure. So we're going to go ahead and use Christopher St. George for our adventure. So the first thing on his card is his attributes for his different skills. So he has strength, dexterity, knowledge, mythos, and movement. Each one of the numbers on the top will represent the number of dice that you'll roll for that check. So if he's required to say take a strength check, he would roll three dice. After that, underneath there, he has his special abilities, and each one of those abilities will either have an infinity symbol or a number. If it has a number, then you will get a number of special ability tokens based on the number that it has, and that is the number of times you'll be able to use that special ability. Otherwise, if it is as the infinity symbol, you can use it any number of times. Underneath there, we have his starting ab abilities, and our, his starting stats, and any starting items that he has. From here we can go ahead and grab his arm overlay and mark the different starting stats that he has. So he has 4 audacity and 15 health. He has a negative 1 courage and his starting items, we'll grab those real quick, he gets the tommy gun and fedora. From there we can place the arm overlay over his card and it will also help us keep track of his courage. There's negative courage going all the way up to negative 10 and the penalties associated with those as we get into those different brackets and also positive courage and the bonuses that you'll get for those. If you make it to positive 10, you would receive a one-time bonus of that ability in there. Even if you go below 10 after that, you will retain that. And if you go to negative 10, then most of the time your character will flee, which we'll take a closer look at later on. From here, we're playing a two-player game, so our hero will get six action tokens. Based on this chart, as you can see here, you'll also grab your hero uh, figure token and your search token. And then, like I said, we're playing a two-player game or two-adventure game, so he, we will also receive two random companions and with our one companion here, he grants us the Fearless ability, so he will, we will also get the Fearless card. From here, we're ready to start. There are a couple different uses for Audacity. Before you make a dice check, you can choose to spend one point of Audacity to increase your successes to fours, fives, and sixes, as opposed to just fives and sixes. And after you make a dice check, you can choose to spend one Audacity to re-roll that dice for that check. Now, when you do this, you must reroll all the dice and not just the ones that missed. And you can continue spending Audacity as long as you have it to continue rerolling. So if the next roll doesn't work out for you, you can spend another point to reroll again. Other than that, there are certain checks that will have you check against your Audacity. So you would look at your current number. So Christopher has a four right now. So if he was required to make an Audacity check, he would get four dice and roll them. Now, a couple other things is you can never go above 10 audacity points, and there are going to be certain tests that will strictly say that you are not allowed to use audacity reroll. To start a new adventure, the first thing you're going to do is go through the scenario book and choose one of the scenarios that you'd like to play. As you can see here, we have chosen to go and play the first scenario, which is the pharaoh with the blue eyes. From here, it's going to give you special instructions to take out certain cards, so for that particular scenario, we're going to take out two carnivorous scarabs, two sphinx, and three keepers of the tomb. And then we need to pull out three artifacts as well. The cowl of Anubis, the staff of Ra, and the ruby scarab. So those will be set off to the side. From here, then we can go ahead and set up the tomb. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and grab the five starting tile tokens, which are the Tomb's Entrance, Quizzoclazel's Hall, and his Descent. And then we can also put out the other two, which are the Pharaoh's Hall, which is the first tile in setup 
for level two. And we can also put out Mongols Hall, which is the first level in level three. From here, then we can go ahead and shuffle up the tile deck, which will have levels one, two, and three tiles mixed into it. And place those off to the side to be drawn when we need them. We can also place out all the tokens that we'll need for the game. So we have our health tokens, our soul shards, and our trap tokens, and any other tokens that you will need for the game as well. From here, we can also start putting out our card decks. So for our tomb deck that we've already customized for the difficulty of the mission that we're going on, Our adventure, misadventure deck, go ahead and shuffle that up and place the starting card on top of it. From here, we can go ahead and put out our two creature decks, which are our basic creature and our advanced creature. Both of those can be shuffled and then place the card concealing the top card of those decks over them. Go ahead and shuffle up the item deck the artifact deck and the companion deck and place those out. And then the last two decks you will not shuffle. The monger deck for the soul shards and your status effect deck. From here the players can go ahead and place out their characters. And then finally, we'll place out our starting tokens in the tomb entrance for our, our adventurers. From here, we're ready to start the game. So Secrets of the Lost Tomb is played over a series of rounds, with each round consisting of two main phases, the adventurer phase and the tomb phase. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at each one of these phases in depth. So the first phase in each round is the adventurer phase. During the adventurer phase, our adventurers are going to spend their action tokens by turning them up to the reload side to do various actions, which we're going to go ahead and take a closer look at each one of those actions in depth. Once they spend their action token, it would proceed to the next adventure in clockwise order. So each turn, the hero can only spend one action token before it moves to the next adventurer. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at each one of the actions that an adventurer can perform during their turn. So the first one we're going to look at is movement, which allows an adventurer to spend an action token to move a number of tiles equal to their movement value. So with Lady Rockets, we're going to go ahead and spend one of our action tokens, and that will allow her to move up to four spaces. She, each space is considered one tile that connects with doorways from both sides of the tile. And then if we choose to move through a doorway that leads into an open area, then we will explore a new area and flip over a new tile for that area. And that will end our movement, even if we have additional movement points available. So if we look at an example of this, we have Lady Rockets that's going to spend her movement action to move up to four tiles away. So she's going to move one here, two, and then let's go ahead and explore up here. So she's going to draw the top tile from the tile deck, and as long as it has the level, of the level that we're on, so we're level one, then we can flip it over. Otherwise, you would discard it and draw the next tile until you find a tile that matches the level you're on. When placing a new tile, you're going to go ahead and line it up with one of the comet symbols to your comet symbol so that there's an open doorway into the tile, and you will end your move in that tile. From there, then you would resolve any effects on that tile. So with her, she would have to draw an adventure card and resolve that, and the first time that she's, she, she's explored this tile, which is now, she would receive a plus one to her knowledge rating. So you would go ahead and grab an attribute token for that and place it on her knowledge, bumping her knowledge up to four. Now the one other thing with movement is if you move into a space or out of a space containing a monster. When you, when you do this, you must make an evade check. So let's go ahead and say with Christopher, that he spent an action to move, and he moves into a space with our monster here. In order to evade, he's going to take a dexterity check, so he would roll four dice based on his dexterity. 
If he successfully passes the test by rolling at least one five or six, then he can continue moving. If he fails it, then he can either stop his movement or choose to take half damage based on the creature's combat rating. So with our creature, it's a two, so he would take one damage. So let's go ahead and see if he passes the dexterity check. And he does with a six, a couple of sixes. So he can continue moving. And you must evade each creature that's in the room. Right now, we only have one. So he's going to go ahead and continue moving and explore this next room up here. So again, he would re reveal and he would line the, the passage up and move in. So the, we have found a trap room. So the first thing we're going to do is place tokens out for the trap. And then we're going to go ahead and resolve. So he must take a strength text or he is going to be slowed. So his strength is three, so he's gonna roll three dice, and he needs at least one, five, or six. And so he rolls both a five and a six, so he's good there. And since he explored the room, then he cannot move any further this turn. He is also gonna remove one token. For each time a character moves into a space that's a trap, you will remove one token from that space, and then he would resolve just like he did. The trade action is done by adventurers being in the same space as each other and spending a action token to initiate a trade. From there, the adventurers can trade any items that they want. The only exceptions to this is that you cannot trade status effects or soul shards. For an adventurer to perform a search action, they must be in a room that does not contain any monsters. From there, then they're gonna spend their action token, check their search token. So right now we're on our green, which is pointing up. And we would consult the chart as you guys can see here. You would roll one dice and check the number on the chart. So we rolled a six. So on the green chart, we would take two treasures from or two items from the item deck, look at them and choose one that we like to keep. So let's go ahead and take the grenade. The other one gets discarded. And then from there, then we can go ahead and turn our search token 90 degrees in clockwise order, so now we're at yellow. Other actions that heroes can perform is spending an action to use any item that they have or artifact or any special ability that they have as well that lists that they would need to use an action for that ability. Adventurers can also choose to rest as an action. In order to do this, they would spend their action token as normal, and then they would be able to do one of three things. They can heal two wounds up to their starting health, heal two courage up to zero courage, or heal one health and one courage up to the starting values. Rest cannot be done in a room that contains a monster. Rest can be used to heal companions, and you cannot choose to, to rest when a hero is fleeing. Adventurers can also spend an action to pick up items that are in a room. To do this, they would spend an action token and then select any items that are in that room and pick them up and put them in their inventory. Adventurers can also choose to drop items into a room. This is not considered an action and they can do this for free so that other adventurers can potentially pick up items. The last action that heroes can perform is a steal action. And this is one that probably won't be used very much as this is a fully cooperative game. So most of the time you're not gonna be stealing from your fellow adventurers and there's only specific scenarios that will allow you to steal from creatures, as most of the time creatures are not allowed to carry items either. But in order to carry this out, the first thing you're going to do as a player is to roll a dexterity check. So we'll go ahead and say that Christopher is trying to steal. So he's going to roll a dexterity check, and he rolls two successes. From there, then he's, going to, he's trying to steal from Lady Rockets, so then she would make a dexterity check to determine the difficulty and she rolls one success. So the winning player, which in this case is Christopher with his two successes, can choose one item or artifact to steal from Lady Rockets. So he's gonna go ahead and steal the, the rocket launcher. And in order to steal from a creature, you would check its, its evasion rating and add one to that value. So our creature here has a rating of zero, so you would only need one success in order to steal from it. Another action that adventurers can perform is to barter with the soulmonger when they are on a space that has the soulmonger symbol and that there are no monsters in that space. 
To do this, they would spend their action token as normal, and then they can go through and barter with the Soulmonger. You can choose to sell items and artifacts back to the Soulmonger for Soul Shards, and as you kill monsters and do other things in the adventure, you will also gain Soul Shards that you can use to barter with the Soulmonger. As you can see on this chart here, you can use your Soul Shards to purchase any items on this list, or you can go through the Soulmonger deck and choose items from there to purchase as well. The next action we're going to look at is the combat action. So in order to do this, we would spend an action token just like any other action, and then we would start a combat against a creature in our space. Now the first time you fight a creature, you're going to take courage damage based on its courage value. So Christopher is going to lose one courage. From there, then he can go ahead and build his dice pool. So the first thing he's going to do is choose an item that he wants to use. So he's going to go ahead and use the Tommy Gun, which is a dexterity weapon. So he's going to get initially his four dexterity from his, his stat. And then the Tommy Gun grants him an additional four attack dice. And then he's going to go ahead and check any of his abilities or anything to see if anything else grants him extra abilities, which his companion does grant him one. And then the last thing he wants to check is an outnumbering bonus. So he's going to add up all the adventures in his space, including companions, which will count for this. So we have him plus his two companions for a three to one outnumbering. So he will get two additional dice for that. Now this is capped off at four, so if you have more than that in there, the maximum you can get is four. Now the one other thing to keep in mind is that Christopher does have the fearless ability, which means that he does not lose courage from creatures. So he moves it back up to one. From here, then we can go ahead and roll our dice. And the one other thing with the Tommy gun is that it succeeds on four, fives, and sixes, Normally, with combat and other success or not other actions, only fives and sixes will be successes. On top of this, anytime you use a weapon item, you're going to go ahead and turn it to its side and resolve its effects during the upkeep phase in the uh, tomb phase. But you can continue using the item. So let's go ahead and roll and see what we get. So we'll go ahead and separate all the fives and sixes that we rolled. And fours as well for this one, but we did not roll any fours. So from here, then we're going to see if we take any damage. So we'll total up our successes. So we have five and compare them to the monster's attack value, which is a two. If we roll less successes than its attack value, then it will do damage to us based on the difference of the values. But we didn't because we beat it 5 to 2, so we're okay there. Another thing to keep in mind is if you do take damage from a monster, if you rolled any critical fails, which are the ones, then any special abilities that that monster have will come into effect. If the monster has it. With a lot of the base level monsters, they do not have any effects. From there, then we're going to go ahead and resolve damage. So the first thing we're going to do is take a look at the fives and compare them to its defense. So it has a defense of one, so it'll eliminate one of those. And one of those goes through. And then we calculate the number of criticals, which are the sixes. The sixes bypass its armor and do straight damage. So we've done a total of four points of damage to the anaconda. So we will go ahead and mark its damage. So it'll take four damage, and its health is five. So one more damage will kill this creature. From here, our attack is finished. Now there's a couple other things I'd like to cover with combat. So let's go back to this example here, and let's go ahead and say that Christopher spent another action later on and attacked the anaconda again, and this time did the killing blow. So the first thing he's going to do is get a number of soul shards equal to the creature's soul shard rating. So he would receive three. If there was any other heroes or uh, adventurers in his space, then they would each receive one soul shard for helping him out. And then from there, then each person that receives soul shards as part of killing the monster will also receive courage based on the monster's courage rating halved rounded up. 
So with the anaconda, it has a curge rating of 1, which halved is 0.5, but rounding back up to 1. So Christopher would receive 1 courage. And same with Lady Rockets, if she was in that space with him, she would also receive 1 courage. So there are two other forms of combat. The creature versus creature combat and adventure versus adventure combat. There are a couple things that I'll cover for the creature versus creature but adventure versus adventure is extremely rare, so I will not be covering that in this video. So for creature versus creature, the controlling creature gets a combat dice pool just as an adventure does. To create a, a creature's dice pool, you're gonna add the adventure's mythos to the creature's combat rating. Combat occurs as normal, except the controlling creature cannot gain or lose courage, does not gain status effects, it cannot use any special abilities and does not produce soul shards when killed. If a controlled creature kills another creature, the controlling adventurer and all other adventurers in the same room gain courage just like normal when a creature is killed. Now that all of our players have used all of their action tokens, we're ready to move into the second phase, which is the tomb phase. The expedition leader or the starting player will draw a tomb card and resolve its effects in order. So we have courage is the the triumph over fear. So the first thing on this card is that all players will receive two courage. So we'll move our each of our adventures courage up by two. And then we would move any creatures and creatures are going to move from room to room based on their movement value by the shortest path to the adventurer that has the most soul shards. Creatures in room with adventurers will not move, and creatures that cannot get to adventurers by any path will simply not move at all. Next, we're gonna move into creature combat. So there's a couple things with this. The first is that during the tomb phase, adventurers can attempt to evade. If they wish to evade, they're going to lose courage equal to the creature's courage attack roll, then they're gonna make a dexterity check, and the number of successes that they need is going to be based on the creature's evasion rating. So if uh, Christopher wanted to, to evade our anaconda, he would have to roll at least one success to get out of there. Now, if he fails, then he must stay in the room. If he passes, then he can move to any adjacent room that he can move to that does not contain monsters. Now, if there's multiple monsters in a room, then you must evade each one successfully in order to leave. From here, we're gonna do the creature combat. So, at this point, each creature is going to attack a, the character that has the most soul shards in a room that they're in with. And that combat is gonna work just like a regular combat that we just saw with the, the hero. So Christopher would gain his four dice for his dexterity because he's going to go ahead and use a Tommy gun again. Even though it, it has been turned, you can continue to use weapons. It just means that you will have to resolve their effect during the upkeep phase. So then he would receive four additional dice for the Tommy gun and one for the companion. Now during the tomb phase, you will not count uh, or calculate the outnumbering bonus. So he would only receive his nine dice this time. And as just like a regular combat, he would roll. Any fives and sixes will count as successes. With the Tommy gun, fours are also included, but we didn't roll any, so we have two successes. From here, then we're going to compare them to the creature's combat rating of two. Again, we did not roll less than, so we're okay there. We don't take any damage. And then we determine how much damage we do to the creature. So it has an armor of one, so we'll get rid of one. We do one damage. So we would mark the creature's attack with one, and that combat has been resolved. Just like in regular combat, if the creature is killed, then you would get soul shards, and the uh, companion or the uh, hero's adventurers would receive uh, courage back. Once all the creature combat has been resolved, then we will spawn creatures, and we will look on this chart here. So for level one, we would spawn one basic creature. And for level 3, we would spawn one basic creature. Now, there are no spawn rooms in level 3 yet, so we don't have to do that. And in level 1, there is one spawn room, so we will spawn one creature from the creature deck. We'll take the top creature. And so we have Blackbeard's Keepers. 
that are going to be placed in that room. Now, if we had multiple rooms, then we would place them in the room that we choose. Once we're done spawning creatures, then we would resolve the upkeep step. So any of our characters that have any items that need to be upkept, we'll take care of that now. So the Tommy gun says that we will roll a dice, and on a one or two, we discard the weapon as it is out of ammo. We did roll a one, so we can discard this. Well, we will discard this now. And we also have a upkeep for our fearless. We will roll a dice, and on a one, that is discarded as well. We rolled a five, so we get to keep our fearless. And our uh, companion grants us one courage during the upkeep step as well, so we'll go ahead and move that up. And all of the rest of the upkeep has been done, so then we're ready to move into the next step. So our search tokens will be turned one for each of our adventurers, and then the common track will finally move up one space. So we'll move it up to one space, and then if there are any effects from that on our scenario that we're playing, then we would resolve them now. From there, then we would discard that card, and we're ready to start a new round. There's a couple other important concepts that I'd like to cover real quick. So the first one is dying. So when an adventurer reaches zero health, so let's go ahead and say that Christopher has received his last point of damage to bring him to zero health, you would place his stand on its side, which obviously in this video I'm already on its side, but normally they would be standing up. So you would place him on his side, then you would place an item token, an item drop token on that space. You would discard all companions that that hero has, as well as soul shards, and any soul monger items are removed from the game. From there, then you would set any items or artifacts you have to the side, which will be what that item drop is referencing. And then after dying, you will choose a new adventurer that has not yet died or fled the tomb and bring him into play. So we can choose any other adventure that we have not used yet. When an adventurer dies, you will move the comet track up one space. Another important concept I'd like to cover real quick is fleeing. So when your courage track reaches the negative 10 mark, or if another effect causes you to flee, at that point, then you have a, a number of things that you're going to follow in sequence. The first is that you're going to discard any companion cards that you happen to have. Then you're going to place an item drop token on the space that you're on and put any items that you have next to that space. Discard any status effects and then move your adventure one room towards the tomb entrance by the shortest path. If you move out of a room that contains monsters, then you're going to take damage equal to half of a monster's combat rating, so we would receive one damage from the anaconda. While fleeing, you gain plus one to your movement and must spend each of your action, or your action tokens to move towards the tomb's entrance. If you are on the tomb's entrance and move again, then you have fled the tomb. Advance the comet trap by one point. So if we have if we spend another move action, we would advance the track by one, and our adventure has left the tomb. Now, there is one way to save an adventurer from fleeing. If an adventurer is sharing a room with a fleeing one, then the non-fleeing adventurer may spend one audacity point to give the fleeing adventurer plus one courage, causing them to stop fleeing. This does not cause cost an action token to do. So, for example, our Lady Rockets could spend one of her audacity to bring our, our courage back up to nine, which would stop our hero from fleeing. So I hope that helped you guys. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the section below. As always, if you find this video helpful, please consider liking it and subscribing to my channel. Every little bit helps. And uh, until next time, see you at the table.